All right. Well, you may have heard there's a storm heading our way. Let's turn now to our chief meteorologist, Matt Safino, for the latest on the approaching storm. And Matt, I know that you've been talking about this all day. You're the hardest working guy in the building. So thanks for being here. This is a big deal. I wonder if you could talk with us about the differences between snow, sleet and freezing rain. Yeah, absolutely, Pat. And I, you know, to your first comment there, I hope people have heard about this by now because yeah. we need to be ready for it. We still have time to prepare too because I don't think it's going to get really bad on the roads until maybe 24 hours from now and maybe a little bit later than that in the Portland area. But as far as the precipitation type, and that's always one of the biggest forecast challenges with an event like this. Are we going to get snow or is it going to be freezing rain or is it going to be sleet? Sleet, by the way, is rain that's frozen when it reaches the ground. Freezing rain arrives at the ground as a liquid, but then it's falling into temperatures that are below freezing, so it coats everything with ice, be it trees, power lines, your car, your windshield, your walkway. So that's the difference. We all know what snow is, too. Nastiest stuff in the Northwest, I want to say, by the way. When I moved down here from the Seattle area, I couldn't believe it. It's bad. It's really bad. And one of the problems with it, too, Pat, is that ice is heavy. Yeah. So it tends to bring it brings down power lines and tree branches way, way more than snow does in the aviation community. Of course, they're really concerned with icing because it adds weight and changes the aerodynamics of a plane. So icing is a really big deal. Let's go through this, though. It was a normal situation with rain. The clouds are up here and for most of our precipitation, if not all here in the mid latitudes, our precipitation actually begins as snow, even in the summertime. But then it melts as it reaches warmer air and you get rain as long as it's above 32 degrees all the way down to the ground. There are some situations where snowflakes survive at say 35, 36, 37, but that's a different story. So when you get freezing rain, there's this layer of warm air that's above 32. So you have snowflakes reaches that warm air that's 32 or warmer and says, hey, I am melting into rain and then it falls back into cold air that's below 32 degrees and that's when the liquid water reaches the ground and freezes on contact. That's the worst case scenario. Sleet's a little bit different. You still have the warm layer, but notice it's not as thick here. It's only about a couple thousand feet thick, if you will. And so the snowflakes fall into that air that's above 32 degrees and they partially melt. They don't necessarily all the way melt, but they turn into globs of, you know, wet snow, if you will. But then they fall back down into the below freezing air and the below freezing air here in a sleet situation is much thicker. So it has time to freeze into ice pellets, if you will, before it reaches the ground. Whereas here, the freezing air below freezing air isn't nearly as thick that layer, so it doesn't have time. So that's why it reaches the ground as a liquid. And then with snow, it's just below freezing all the way down. It starts to snow in the clouds and reaches the ground as snow. So that's what we're facing here. We may see a period of sleet as we get a little bit of a nose of warm air moving in above Portland during the evening hours tomorrow. But I think that's going to be the worst of it as far as we're concerned here in Portland, Pat. OK, and I think that that sleet, that's the stuff that's almost like little BBs that are falling down, right? Yeah, ice pellets is another word for it. It's okay. often confused with hail. Hail and sleet are similar because they both arrive at the ground as ice, but it's a completely different process that causes hail. We'll get hail in the summertime when temperatures are in the 40s or 50s. That's if it's if it's above freezing you're getting hail. If it's below freezing, you're getting sleet because it's a situation like this. OK, and good luck walking if it's freezing rain. I've never seen before I moved here, never seen water fall on ice. It's brutal. Anyway, I yeah. know that you've been relying on a lot of the different models that are going on throughout the, the world as you try to forecast all this. Can you explain some of the differences in those? You bet. And, and it's a great tool and we rely on that to give you good forecast. But there's many, many different models now. And then within any model group, let's say the European model, what we do is we run what we call ensembles or groups of models and they each give us a slightly different solution. So here's an example. This is for Portland. This is going forward with temperatures actually with uh, something we call QPF, which is quantitative precipitation forecast. Nice. It's the amount of moisture that is going to fall out of the sky and it doesn't take into account the phase of that, whether it's snow or sleet or freezing rain, but it gives us a good idea as to how much moisture the atmosphere is going to drop on us and then you decide is it going to be frozen or not. But as far as the modeling goes in the ensemble approach, you every gray, every single gray line here represents a different model. OK, and in the beginning, they're all together, but notice the spread. Now, the black line here is an average and the blue line is what we call the deterministic model. That's the one that we get maps for and we see that one map and it's like this is how it's going to be. Those aren't always right. So with the ensemble approach, you look at this and notice it's a big difference between about a half an inch of moisture to a couple of inches of moisture. 
And you look at, and then what we do is we average that. And then we get statistics on that. And if the spread is less, then we have higher confidence that, okay, this model knows what it's going to do. And this is within the range of possibility. We know that that's probably the best way to go. And then look out in time, you get this wild spread because as you go farther and farther out in time, the models change a lot because of the physics and the dynamics of the models themselves. So that's what the uh, ensemble approach is. Here's another example of it. it. Looks like we'll call this a spaghetti chart because it looks <laughs> like a bowl of spaghetti with the models going all over a place in the really widespread farther out in time. One final graphic on this. This is from the Met Office, uh, the UK Met Office over in uh, the UK. So a lot of it depends on the initial conditions. You, you know, you think like, okay, we know exactly what the weather is doing at this point in time. We're not talking about a forecast. We're like it's an observation. This is what is happening. But when you're forecasting numerically, you need to know the state of the atmosphere over a very wide area and then a very wide area vertically as well. And of course, we live next to the Pacific Ocean, which is a big data void. So it takes a lot of fancy math to make up for that lack of data. And then what you'll do with ensembles is you'll say, OK, you'll just kind of tweak the initial conditions a little bit and make them a little bit different and see how that changes the output of the model. And then you get a different forecast depending on the initial conditions of that model. And then if you look at this circle, it's climatology, and this blue area is the forecast uncertainty. Well, you want to land somewhere in there, but again, there's a lot of spread, so we will rely on statistics to give us an average, and the less spread there is, the higher the confidence we have. And that's just for one model. We have several different models that we do this for. <laughs> wow, fascinating. All right, thank you, Matt. By the way, folks, I hope you really appreciate that. He's not a TV guy who knows weather. He's a meteorologist <laughs> who happens to be on TV, and he's really good. Thanks, Pat. Thank you, Matt. Coming up on the 